now to welcome you all to the Hub Week's Future Forum. Please welcome to the stage our first speaker, David Sung Kong. Good morning, Hub Week. How y'all feeling out there? You guys feeling good? Yes. If you guys are feeling good about the Future Forum, can you just say yeah with me one more time? Say yeah. Awesome. Hub Week, uh, I am so honored and privileged to be here to speak with you all to open the Future Forum. My name is David Sun Kong. Um, I wanted to first start by just giving a shout out to Kathleen and Linda and Max and Brendan and all of the incredible folks that have been working so, so hard on this event. Can we give them all a big round of applause for all of their hard work and making this all happen? Um, just the scale of what's happening here just completely blows my mind. Uh, I'm so impressed and just all of the logistics involved and it's been so much work. So really congratulations to you all for, for just an amazing event. Um, so again, I'm coming here and speaking to you all as a synthetic biologist and biohacker from MIT. I'm also a, a community organizer and a photographer, a DJ. But the main thing I think that I am representing here today is a native of the greater Boston area. Uh, I'm born and raised from Lexington, Massachusetts. I am a huge, huge, huge uh, lover and supporter of all things Boston. So uh, it's so great to be here to help represent uh, my city in this area. And so, again, Hub Week is ultimately a celebration of innovation at the intersection of art, science, and technology. And what I'm going to do today is share with you all some uh, stories and some work uh, that I've been working on that's kind of at those, uh, that, those intersections. But I think there's a fourth element, too, that we're going to talk about throughout today and this week which is community, right? Technology isn't developed in a vacuum. It's always got to be developed with considerations to the people that are going to be impacted by it locally and globally. And so a lot of the stories that we'll be hearing about, uh, both in my talk today and throughout um, Hub Week, are local stories to Boston, but also their connection to global impact, right? And that's, I think, a big part of what Hub Week in Boston is all about. And so I wanted to start actually with a little bit of a personal story uh, about my family, because my family is also a local story, a Boston story, but also a global story. Um, so this is a photograph of my parents uh, in Harvard Square, probably in the, in the 70s at some point. Um, and my parents, they, they came to the US, they met in Syracuse, and um, ultimately moved to Boston in 1969. Um, that was when my dad joined the faculty at MIT. So he was in the electrical engineering and computer science department for almost 40 years. And my mom was a professor at UMass Boston in statistics. So if any of you took math in UMass Boston in the past like 20 years, you might have had a class with her. And so, um, you know, I grew up in, in, again, in Lexington in the Boston area, family of, uh, you know, nerds, right? Uh, me and my sister, both very big nerds. We, uh, you know, followed the nerd dream and, and uh, went to MIT. Uh, you know, our parents were very happy about that. And, uh, and you know, again, I, I feel very privileged to have grown up in Lexington and being surrounded by uh, so many creative uh, folks in such a wonderful, warm, and loving community. Most recent family photo uh, at Burning Man, right? The Kong family is what we do is we go to Burning Man for our family uh, vacations. That giant gramophone in the back, actually, my sister was the project manager for that. So when you uh, go to MIT, you learn how to manage big projects and build giant art pieces in the desert, too. So that's another side benefit. Um, and so I've had the great privilege of being able to work in a lot of different creative forms, in addition to the science and technology, also, again, through music, through photography. And uh, more recently, in the past uh, just few months, I've joined the Media Lab to direct a new community biotechnology initiative. And so these are some of the amazing students that I get to work with, uh, only sexy people allowed, right? And um, sexy, beautiful people. And so, you know, one of the things, again, though, that I think very deeply about ultimately is community, right? Technology ultimately has to have an impact on the world and so the question that I have, particularly with biotechnology, which is my technical field, is, you know, how do we ultimately ensure that there's really broad, diverse participation in biotech, right? Um, we've had the information technology revolution. We've got digital fabrication and tabletop 3D printers. Uh, and we're in this era now where biotechnology is going to be increasingly becoming more and more a part of our everyday lives. And it's really going to have, as, many, as myself and many others believe, as big an impact, if not more, than all of the technical regu technological revolutions that came before it. And so the question is, you know, how do we ensure that we end up having really diverse participation? For, some, for a technology that's going to impact the entire living world, having that kind of uh, input and participation is, is really, really critical. And so uh, this is what our group thinks about. You know, how do we make biotechnology radically diverse? 
um, in its history, right, most recently there's a field called synthetic biology, which uh, in, in large part was birthed at MIT in the early 2000s. And that was an exploration of engineering biological systems. So we had folks like Drew Endy, who's one of my dear friends and colleagues, um, who was a civil engineer and built bridges and, and uh, buildings and thought, why can't I build and engineer living systems the way I can build, uh, you know, kind of bridges and dams? Uh, we had folks like Tom Knight, uh, who was a computer scientist and electrical engineer and thought, you know, why can't I hack living systems the way, same way I can hack a computer program? Uh, and so Ginkgo Bioworks, they're going to be a big part of Hub Week. I know Jason Kelly, uh, one of dear friend and colleague, will be speaking uh, tomorrow. And so we've got this really great experience of technical diversity, right? And again, Hub Week, arc science and technology. But how do we move past technical diversity? How do we think about other types of diversities, like socioeconomic diversity, cultural, artistic diversity, right? Um, this is a photograph that I took at my community center uh, that I run in Cambridge in Central Square called EMW. And this to me is kind of like a picture of the future vision of the communities involved in biotech, right? Um, we've got a socioeconomically diverse group. Um, this is a uh, communities all throughout the Boston area. And uh, this is a particular event, um, uh, an open mic that we host called East Meets Words. This is the Muslim hipsters, the mipsters we're featuring. And uh, we've got this just amazing crew of, you know, culturally, socioeconomically, creatively diverse people. And, um, you know, ultimately, again, the, the question goes back to participation. And I feel like there are a couple of key ingredients for how we get this diverse participation in biotech. So, one, accessible spaces and tools, right? Biotech is still a very infrastructure um, kind of reliant technology. You can't just, you know, kind of do a startup in your own, in your own bedroom like you can with software. Um, and we also need great infrastructure, great infrastructure for learning and sharing. Um, and all of that is kind of pointless if you don't have in vibrant, engaged communities that are ultimately working through these tools, working with these tools. And if all of that works, maybe you can get some shift in culture, right? And I'll conclude with a, a project that we've been working on called Bio to Beats, which is a big kind of cultural hacking project around hip hop and bio. So I'll talk quickly first about spaces, right? So biotech right now still is a, a pretty privileged art form. You have to be in places like, uh, you know, kind of corporations or places like MIT. MIT is a very, very privileged place, right? The media lab where I get to work every day. It's a, an incredible place to work. But, you know, how do you get involved if you're a member of the public and you want to get into biotechnology, right? And so there's a really interesting technological movement that's been happening, something called do-it-yourself biology or community biology, where people are starting to set up labs in these kind of non-traditional spaces. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of innovation that's happened in non-traditional spaces like garages. You might have heard of a couple of guys that invented some things in a garage. Um, and so there's this really interesting ecosystem emerging. Um, and do-it-yourself do biology is now a global phenomenon, but it actually started here in Cambridge. So the very first DIY bio meetup happened at the Asgard Pub in Cambridge, okay? So, and from that, it kind of bloomed into this global phenomenon. And you have spaces like GenSpace in Brooklyn, uh, BioCurious over in Sunnyvale, and uh, you know here locally in Boston we've got Boss Lab, which is over over in Somerville, and of course uh, you know we've got a space that's very near dear to my heart, um, EMW Bookstore, uh, which was uh, started out at East Meets West Bookstore. So again, this was a bookstore founded by my parents in the late '90s. So it started out selling China's language books, and then um, you know my father again he was a professor in electromagnetic wave theory. So his three favorite letters were E, M, and W for electromagnetic wave, and then also East meets West. So that's what we still call our center today, EMW. And we started out, again, as a, as a cultural space focusing on social justice and the arts, so poetry, music, and primarily for uh, the Asian American community. But over the years, it's ballooned into this really amazing center that explores art forms across all kinds of different creative modes. So, uh, you know, this is a photograph of some of the amazing uh, team that I get to work with at EMW. Uh, we have a lot of fun there. And again, we work with musicians. These are the, the jazz thug slash freelancer group that came out of uh, Berklee College of Music in Boston. Um, we work with the local Tibetan community through our, um, our gallery. We work with a lot of different social justice groups in the low school Boston area. Um, and again, street artists. This is Sara Nguyen. She grew up here in Boston and is now a world famous street artist and, and uh, videographer and filmmaker. And uh, this is Juno Diaz uh, from MIT speaking at the opening of our community library. And again, we've worked with all of these amazing spoken word poets and artists and hip hop uh, musicians, uh, electronic music producers uh, over the years. And more recently, oh, and also beatboxers, some of the greatest beatboxers on the planet uh, come through EMW as well. And more recently, we've been getting into community biotechnology, right? So thinking about, again, biotech outside of these traditional institutional spaces. And so this is from some, uh, some friends and colleagues from the Media Lab when we were first doing some first uh, kind of biohacking in our space. 
And over the past couple of years, we've been really engaging the public and thinking about uh, the future of biotech, setting up our own laboratory space and hosting different types of workshops and engaging with the public. Uh, we recently had an amazing art gallery called Culturalizing Science, where we explored citizen science and bio art and design. Again, a lot of people, when they think about biotech, they think about you know, therapeutics or pharmaceuticals, but there's this whole new set of vistas and dimensions around biotech, exploring all of these other creative forms that are now emerging, which I find incredibly exciting. Um, and so again, we've had a lot of fun uh, at EMW over the past couple of years, and, and particularly working with youth. So that's a great passion of mine as well. So we have a youth science initiative um, in, at, at EMW, and this was a collaboration with the Cambridge Science Festival. And uh, this was an event that we did with Ginkgo Bioworks. We had our youth, which again, were primarily uh, young, young women of color, uh, learning about how to engineer organisms, uh, learning about the interface between programming and microscopy. Uh, and then one of our, my favorite events was one that we did with uh, the Museum of Science in Boston and Katie Coleman, who's one of my heroes, right? She's an astronaut, uh, just one of the most amazing people around. And uh, with Katie, we explored life beyond Earth, right? How do we build biolabs in outer space and how do we get to Mars and terraform it, right? So these are all kind of the different types of visioning that we're doing with our youth. And so the other, one of the other big activities we do at EMW is, uh, is again, going back to kind of infrastructure for resources and learning. Uh, is a, a class that I teach with Professor George Church at Harvard University and Jean-Michel Lenar of Tufts called How to Grow Almost Anything. So it's this biotechnology course across scales. So we start with biodesign and then how to design your own DNA molecules, how to put those molecules into organisms so that they can produce new, uh, produce new things, make new materials, um, how to sense those materials, how to fabricate and do 3D bioprinting, um, how to do tissue engineering, um, and then even uh, ecosystem engineering, right? So we learn all about gene drive technology, which is developed by my colleague at the Media Lab, Kevin Esvel. So we teach this kind of biotech uh, course across scales, but we do it in a global distributed way. So we teach it to the global fab lab network. So there are over 1,200 of these quote unquote fab labs worldwide. And by the way, again, going back to this idea of local and, um, and global impact, uh, the Fab Foundation, which was spun out from the Media Lab at MIT by my uh, colleague, uh, Neil Gershenfeld, um, the very first Fab Lab in the United States was established right here in Boston, the South End Technology Center. And so uh, we've gone from one, uh, just a couple of Fab Labs to now you know, over 1,200 uh, around the world. And what we're doing with George is basically trying to augment these Fab Labs with Biolabs. And so We've had a lot of fun uh, over the past couple of years uh, teaching this class. It happens every Wednesday morning, and we're joined by laboratories from all around the world. So basically every continent, um, you know, we get Tokyo, Barcelona, Paris, uh, and all throughout the US uh, join us every Wednesday morning where we teach this global curriculum. And so it's a tremendous amount of fun working with uh, George and this amazing group of students. And, uh, and again, all of these other incredible faculty that are, uh, are, are, many of them are in Cambridge at MIT and at Harvard. And so, um, recently, um, you know, again, in looking at this global landscape, um, you know, we've got this thousand fabrication laboratories, but we also have more than a hundred now of these community bio labs worldwide. So I mentioned, you know, Bots Lab, EMW, we have a community lab, and there are more than a hundred of these now, part of this larger global movement. And when I joined the Media Lab a few months ago, the first thing that uh, our group worked on was organizing a global community bio summit. So bringing together all of the people that are all around the world interested in setting up uh, their own laboratories and really pushing biotechnology to this next phase of, of creativity. And so we brought uh, all of these, uh, you know, more than 200 participants from all around the world uh, to come to the Media Lab so where we could exchange ideas, build fellowship, and really think about the future of biotech. And so. Uh, again, we had laboratories represented from, from basically every continent except Antarctica. And uh, we had an amazing time, right? You know, Joey Ito uh, challenged us to think about, you know, this movement around um, accessible biotechnology, right? This is one of the big things that I really care about and think a lot about. And um, we had a number of really, you know, this is just kind of a snippet of what we did over this weekend, but um, we had folks like Alicia Wooten, who's a, a doctoral student at, uh, in biomedical science at BU. Um, Alicia is, herself is deaf. And um, she gave this amazing presentation about accessibility, right? Um, you know, we in this, this uh, kind of global community bio movement, we think about, about ourselves as people that are really passionate about accessible science, but you know, what does accessibility really mean for those that actually have disabilities? And how thoughtful are we in really making sure that our laboratories are, are really accessible for them as well? Um, we have folks like Allison Irvine from the Biodesign Challenge and Genspace in Brookline coming and presenting about the future of biological design, right? 
um, we've got amazing folks like uh, Rodrigo over here who's uh, thinking all about biodesign as well, right? So, so we've got this whole new generation of designers and artists now that are engaging bi in biology, which I think inc is incredibly exciting. And folks like my, my buddy Thomas from Cameroon, who's really, really critical in a lot of ways about the broader maker movement and really thinks that innovation has to serve local social needs. And so I think all of these diverse perspectives are, are so critically important. Um, and, you know, this is George Church. And at George, uh, you know, again, we were thinking about all of these different obstacles to biotechnology. And you, you know, think you need certain tools and infrastructure. Maybe you need certain degrees and pedigree. And, you know, George was just like, yeah, just ignore all of that. Ignore all of that and go and do it, right? Just go do it and go make it happen, which I thought was really, really great advice. And so, uh, speaking of George, right, George is, I think, one of the loveliest people that I know and is going to be speaking um, as part of uh, Hub Week tomorrow. Uh, this is a photograph that I took of George at the March for Science in Boston. And um, George is now the subject of a new book called Wooly by uh, the one and only Ben Mesrick. So Ben, uh, he writes these amazing books that get turned into these huge blockbuster movies. So he wrote this book about the MIT Blackjack Club. So fun fact about me, I was actually part of the MIT Blackjack Club back back in the day. Um, but uh, he wrote a book called uh, Bringing Down the House, which got turned into this huge movie called 21, which you may have heard of. And he wrote this book called um, The Accidental Billionaires, which got turned into the movie The Social Network. And so Ben's latest book, Wooly, uh, is you know going to be some massive you know trillion dollar movie, and um, and they're looking at different actors right now to star George, and they haven't decided yet. Uh, one possibility is Jeff Bridges, who I think would be a really amazing choice for this. Those of you who know George Church, I think Jeff would be a really great choice. They're also very seriously considering uh, Tom Hanks. So this is like Castaway Tom Hanks, who I think would be another amazing choice to play George Church. I mean, totally serious, by the way. And you can ask George tomorrow, you know, and he can confirm or deny. Um, but, you know, this all kind of leads into this broader point about culture, right? So biotechnology, um, you know, viewed around the world, there's a lot of different perspectives on it. And it's really, really important that we communicate the power of biotech um, to the world and really engage through cultural mechanisms. And movies and films are one of those mechanisms. And um, so I'll conclude uh, by talking about a project that I'm really, really excited about that's exploring um, the intersection of biotech and culture, um, and specifically hip hop. Okay, so I've been giving this talk with a weird title, which is Can Hip Hop Save Biotechnology? Uh, how many of you like hip hop here in the room? Ah, see, this is why, right? So hip hop is one of the great cultural languages of our time. Uh, you know, I grew up as a child of the 80s and 90s, grew up on hip hop. And, um, you know, again, I, I think that with this incredible cultural language, there comes this question of, you know, how do we kind of cross over and mash up something like hip hop with something like biotech, right? Um, you know, my boss at the Media Lab, uh, Joey Ito, he's a big fan of this idea of, into, of called anti-disciplinary research. So the stuff that doesn't happen in the silos, right, the stuff that's in the white spaces in between tends to be the most exciting, interesting stuff. And so we started thinking about, you know, this intersection of hip hop and biotech. And we did it in the context of this competition called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, or iGEM, which is another amazing example of something that started locally here in Boston and it's grown into this global phenomenon. So this year in iGEM 2017, there's more than 5,000 participants from 40 plus countries, hundreds of teams around the world, and so a couple of years ago, uh, or last year, our community lab uh, decided to participate in iGEM. Um, I personally have uh, uh, go back to iGEM all the way back to when it first started at MIT as just a, a class in January. And uh, my most important role with iGEM actually is I'm the official iGEM DJ. So uh, I get the great privilege of uh, rocking a party for like 4,000 synthetic biology nerds every year. Um, this happens every single year at the Heinz Convention Center. iGEM is happening actually just in about three or four short weeks. So you want to come and party with a bunch of uh, biotech nerds, come talk to me afterwards. I can sneak you in the party. Um, and so, you know, our, our lab, our community laboratory, again, you know, I've, I've showed you about, I've told you about EMW. We have all of these amazing, you know, music producers and DJs. And so you know, we're literally having this meeting thinking, you know, what could we do for this iGEM project? And we asked ourselves a question, you know, what does your microbiota sound like, right? How many of you heard about the human microbiome? Few of you, most of you, okay. So, so the basic idea is that, you know, you actually are not alone, right? You're covered in like, in living in this, this symbiosis with like a hundred trillion microorganisms that influence almost every aspect of your development and um, also cognition, right? There's a link between all the microorganisms in your gut and your brain. And so there's a lot of amazing research that's being done to study the, the science of the microbiome. But we kind of were thinking about an art project, right? So what, what, how can we make music from these microorganisms from the body? And so we made this system that we call Biota Beats, which is a microbial record player that translates data about microorganisms into sound. And so 
you know, we know how uh, DJs can scratch vinyl. And we thought, you know, what if we could make our own bacterial records, right, that we could scratch and interact with, right? And you'll notice, uh, you know, appropriate sterile technique with the gloves. Got to have the gloves on. Okay. So, so we built this really cool system, and it's built literally on top of a, of a DJ turntable. And it features uh, our biota records, which we can cultivate, uh, cultivate microbes from the body, and then a heating element and a microcontroller so, and a camera so we can kind of image these bacteria over time and gather a lot of different data about them. And then we have a set of algorithms that converts that data into different types of sounds. And so uh, we use these kind of laser cut acrylic records that are literally designed to be like EP and LP vinyl records. And uh, we include this, uh, this media on it so that bacteria can grow. And then basically you just sample different uh, parts of the body and then you inoculate them on side, onto these records. And then we monitor the bacteria over time and we can extract data like uh, you know, their, their colony size, their growth rate, what body part they came from, their location, um, and so on. And then from that data, we can ultimately generate music. So you guys interested in hearing some microbial music? Yeah? Yeah, all right, let's do it. It's morning time, perfect time to listen to some bio beats. So, okay, wow, nice sound system. Some feed bacteria here. This is from uh, one of my students, Yi Xiao. Um, genitalia, bacteria, very menacing. <laughs> And then uh, we've got the belly button, very ethereal sounding microorganisms. The armpit, very important uh, part of the human microbiome. The mouth, the oral microbiome is actually one of the most fascinating uh, sources of microorganisms in the body, in my opinion. And then when you bring them all together, uh, they can come together in a bit of a symphony like this. mouth and foot duet. What do you guys think? So um, there's an amazing, amazing uh, family of folks that have worked so hard on this aspect of this project. I want to shout out in particular uh, Sarah, who is currently in the Netherlands, who did all of the visualizations. Chuck Kim, who is an, a music producer in LA, who took all of the raw MIDI data and helped to make it really sound beautiful. And then Gautam and Alex, uh, two of my students who are uh, really, really amazing and on the software side and doing a lot of the coding. And so just to wrap this all up, we, uh, you know, had a cool, you know, kind of prototype there, and we thought to ourselves, you know, it wouldn't it be great, you know, DJs have, like, vinyl record collections, right? What if you could have a biota record collection, right? What if you could collect microorganisms from some really cool, interesting people? Um, you know, this is a photograph that I took of, of Q-Tip, who's one of my all-time favorite uh, MCs and uh, DJs. Um, you know, what if we could get music and bacteria from, from Q-Tip and make beats from his bacteria? Uh, There's a photograph I took of Questlove, you know, again, another one of my favorite uh, DJs. And I had this amazing opportunity a couple of months ago uh, to meet the legendary DJ Jazzy Jeff. Uh, so I grew up listening to Jazzy Jeff and his music, and I still do today. So it was a real honor to meet him at this event called On Cue, which I met a number of you at, actually. And, um, and so what we did, what I did was um, we actually set up a little do-it-yourself laboratory in the green room. And so you know, I brought some Biota records and some Deionized water, and I was like, hey, Jeff, can I get some of your microorganisms? Because we want to make some hip-hop beats out of them. Would that be cool? And Jeff was just so cool. He was like, I'm down. Let's do this, right? So he gets out the Q-tips, and he starts uh, you know, sampling some of his oral microbiome. 
And um, this, is, this is, I think, my favorite photograph of all time. So this is DJ Jazzy Jeff inoculating bacteria onto Luria Broth Media on a Biota record. And, and look at the smile on his face. Like, he's, like, so happy to be doing uh, biology right now and be, being a biohacker. So, so Jeff just, uh, you know, was, was so, so excited and in love with this project. Some good branding to the Media Lab, like, logo and is reflected in his glasses. Um, but Jeff was just a, just a huge fan of this. And so now we're collaborating and working on um, some microbial music as part of his new album. And so uh, we've worked with uh, a bunch of really great folks. So, you know, George, George Church, uh, we're making some music from his uh, bacteria as well. But, um, you know, again, uh, oh, and, and one final thing we're doing, this is actually happening as part of iGEM. This, this is going to be the biggest project we've tried. We're actually going to try to make music out of the collective microbiome of the entire iGEM competition. So 5,000 students, we're going to do a high throughput uh, sampling, and then we're working with iGEM to do like high throughput analysis and, uh, of all of these microbes, and then we're going to try to create a little composition out of this global community. We're calling it Universe, Universe for one song. And so um, these are some amazing folks, but, but actually I think the, the microbiome and the music of the microbiome that I'm maybe most excited about for Hub Week is actually none other than Linda Henry. So uh, this is Linda with uh, my student, Atasia, and uh, Linda so graciously uh, also volunteered some of her microorganisms to be a part of Biota Beats. And so uh, I wanted to share with you guys, if it's okay with you, and this is, this is uh, these are uh, Linda's microbes having uh, grown up over a couple of days, which look beautiful. And uh, um, Linda, if it's cool with you, I'm going to play some music that we made from your, your bacteria. So we can, we can start with this. So this is uh, the mouth bacteria. Now the ears. The scalp. And from the skin microbiome near the elbow. Calm before the storm. And this is the full band from Linda playing all together. So everyone, um, it's been such a thrill to be here. Uh, I hope that you can see that, you know, science, technology, art, um, there are such beautiful elements that we brought together, we can really make beautiful things happen in this world. Um, my name is David Sun Kong, and it's my incredible uh, privilege and honor to welcome to the stage right now the co-founders of Hub Week, Linda Henry and Kathleen Kennedy. So please, a round of applause for Linda and Kathleen. What an incredible way to kick off the Future Forum. I sound way cooler than I am. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. You need to get that record for your collection. Fantastic. David, thank you so much. We, can't, we couldn't think of a better way to illustrate art, science, and technology coming together in such a cool way. Thank you. Thank you.